I'm Melissa Rosenberg. You're a writer. I am. Can I tell them about stuff that you have written that they may have been watching? Like Jessica Jones, like all of the entire Twilight movies. You worked on Dexter for a long time, right? Four years, yeah. When you started your career as a writer of scripts, before that you were an executive, right? No. No? No, I, I came out of college and started writing, but I, that had not been my, my goal. I had actually wanted to be a choreographer, uh, mm. but then came out and discovered that TV was written. I didn't, you know, I didn't know that. It wasn't as widely publicized as before. You know, you think, mm -hmm. uh, oh, the actors make it up. I realized that that was an actual job, and that appealed to me enormously. So, okay, now I have my story straight. You grew up as a dancer. I was a jack of, of, of all trades, master of none at the time, and dancing was one of the things that I wanted to do, uh, choreography specifically, but uh, I wasn't good enough, quite honestly. And then I, I sort of had always written, and uh, then I went back to graduate school actually in producing. Came out with a master's, and then I just started plugging away. Do you feel like that helped your writing to get the producing side? Yeah, very much so. Uh, it, it helped me a lot with just structuring a script to make it, well, in the process of structuring it, to make it something that's actually shootable. And none of those Gone with the Wind and, and Atlanta burned the famous sentence. <laughs> Amazing right. dogs later. I think there's one of those in American Werewolf in London, maybe. And there's a line that's like, he transforms into a werewolf. Yeah. <laughs> it's like five or six words. That's like five days of shooting. And yeah, I do these Q and A's on Instagram and all kinds of writers ask all kinds of questions. And a lot of people ask questions about breaking into the business, which is a, a nebulous thing right now because we are in a global pandemic. But when you were attempting to break in as a writer, do you have a day job at the time? Uh, I had several. I was a bartender. I was an assistant to a lawyer, uh, an entertainment lawyer. I was a temp. I was a masseuse. I was. I had a lot of different jobs. How did you um, self motivate? Do you remember that being hard or easy? Yeah, self motivating is always a little bit tough. But in, in some cases, I would take classes, so I would have a goal in order to, that I had to achieve. That helped a lot. So whenever I was really struggling with motivation, I would do that. It, it, it never mattered is the teacher good, is the teacher bad. It doesn't matter because everyone has something new to teach. You know, I have something new to learn from everybody in the class as well as the teacher, whether or not he's a brilliant or she's a brilliant teacher or not. That's a pretty hot tip because deadlines can be your best friend. Yeah. To get yourself out of that precious, like, it'll never be perfect. I must work on it forever kind of headspace. Out of one of the uh, classes that I took at AFI, the teacher of that class ended up doing some, some private classes. And a group of about eight of us did workshops in his home. He then uh, ended up leaving the state for one reason or another a couple of years. And then we started our own writers group. And that writing group kept going for 20 years. Wow, and, 20 uh, years. Yeah. I mean, the, the members changed uh, throughout, and uh, there are a lot of lovely careers that have come out of it, uh, including my own. Uh, I really attribute a lot of that to that writing group. How did that work? How does your writer's group work? Well, it, it's about six to eight people, no more than eight, and we'd meet once a week, Wednesdays, uh, and each week someone would be assigned to bring the food, which generally was pizza. It was very much about the work. It was not a bitch session about the industry. Uh, there was no alcohol. It was this very professional group. We met at 7 p.m., went till uh, the latest would be 10. Uh, you'd bring in whatever you had. If you had pages, you'd assign, if you had actual script pages, you'd, you'd assign uh, roles to the various different other writers. And when they're reading your roles, we were such horrible actors that as if, if it's playing when we're doing your roles, you're in good shape. <laughs> Sometimes it would be just ideas, people you were bringing ideas and we'd pitch around on that or outlines. If it was a full script, we'd give it to each other, uh, you know, a week in advance or five days in advance and then come with notes. And so it taught me a, a lot. And one, it provided that deadline that I, I needed. And two, it taught me how to be in a room. And in this situation, no one was the boss. It wasn't a job, but it was, it taught me how to, how to do notes very quickly and how to, how to respond in the moment uh, without the pressure of, my job being on the line. Now I have to say it's probably the single best thing I ever did to launch a career, to learn how to do it. I think a theme is emerging about setting up something in your life that creates external pressure. That uh, group continued on. It was mostly myself and, and Dana Brother, who is mm -hmm. my, my best friend. And now you're making a show together, right? Yeah, exactly. 
you're just basically describing the dream where you hang out with friends, help each other out with your work, and then sell something and get paid to do the same thing. Yeah, that's the yeah. dream. <laughs> that's absolutely the dream. You are absolutely correct. Uh, so you mentioned that it is a little bit similar to having like a writer's room. Yeah. Uh, was Jessica Jones the first room you ran or did you have room running experience before? No, before that, there was a short lived show on ABC called Red Widow. The title was not my choosing, <laughs> uh, but it was based on a Dutch series that I loved. It was on the wrong network at the wrong time in this golden age of TV. It should have been. I saw it. I thought it was awesome. I loved it. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I was just adored it, but it was a, a mother who was selling drugs. And at that time you can't, you couldn't have a woman be, if she's a mother, that's it. You, you, she has to be noble. Mm -hmm. Everything she does is like, well, she can't go to that meeting because if she died, she would be you know, a terrible mother and leave her kids alone. It's like, well, okay, what can she do then? Uh, trust me, I've met plenty of mothers, had one myself that wasn't exactly noble. So. <laughs> but now you could have, you know, I mean, then came Weeds and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Nurse Jackie and that. So it would have been better then, unfortunately. I mean, I do think that what you're describing is something we're still contending with. Like, there have been characters who have pushed the envelope a little bit, but I don't know about you, I still get well-meaning notes sometimes that kind of go back to that horrible word like ability that never, ever, ever come up for male characters. No, it really doesn't. It really doesn't. It's still an issue. I have drunkenly gushed about Jessica Jones to you at parties, but... Um, I remember, I must have been drunk too. <laughs> I, I feel like part of that show's reason for being was to sort of rage against some of these boxes that we put female characters in and that she was so self-aware about the kind of damage that had been inflicted upon her. And I'm wondering if you knew that this was part of what you wanted to do when you either took that job or pitched for that job or it was sent to you. Did you know that that's what it was about? No, I, I mean, I knew that it was a character that I could glom onto and explore some really fun stuff. Honestly, all I saw was just this great character in the Marvel Universe, which I love the Marvel Universe, and she wasn't a, a sort of B-level hero and kind of a wreck and with a really damaged past. And I saw that, and that was my entire focus. And after the first season came out, and this was, uh, I think the first season came out just after the whole uh, Me Too movement began, and there were all these very beautiful think pieces on it as if we had gone into it trying to make a, a statement. And we just, I mean, we walked into that room every day as feminists, all of us mm -hmm. in the room were feminists, men and women, and and so we approached the character just from that point of view, but it was not intending to be a treatise on domestic violence or rape even or anything. It was meant to be a kick-ass female flawed character that I'd never seen on, or that I'd rarely seen on, on television. Yeah, the same thing happened to us with the show You. The Me Too movement really exploded while we were in post on our first couple of episodes. That's when the Harvey Weinstein case started yeah. uh, in the press. So when the season came out, it was viewed largely through that lens because it's a woman, essentially every frame of that thing is a man violating a woman because he's stalking her and everything he's saying is kind of a lie. People sort of asked, you know, did you have this message in mind? I mean, I just asked you that question question too, but it did in, in our room, it kind of felt the same, which is that people were just reflecting on their own lived experience. Whether or not they had literally been stalked, the men in the room had a lot to say about toxic masculinity. The women in the room had a lot to say about how they can't fucking win, <laughs> right? Yeah. No matter what they do. And so we just made a show to talk about it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, our entire goal was to be true to that character and honest and authentic about what she might be going through, how she might perceive things. And that was the, the root of everything. And without any sort of political agenda other than everything's a political <laughs> statement, really. Do you feel like you came into the jobs you've had for the last few years with a particular affinity for genre? Did you consider yourself a genre writer? Um, I didn't until I realized that I was one. But I guess the twilight of it kind of launched me Although that kind of launched me into more of this sort of YA thing, which hmm. I still get people sending me YA stuff. And I'm going, you know, I did it. I, I did it five times. I'm not going to do it again. I'm not going to do it better. I'm not going to do it any worse. I'm just like, thank you. I love YA if you can if you can make it adult, you know. But every time the YA stuff that I get sent is always like, well, there's a girl and she falls in love with a bad boy. And turns out he's a fill in the blank. It's just gotten dull at this point. 
it's really, really obvious when stuff aimed at young women is being condescending to them. At the moment, I happen to be working on the, the show that Dan and I are doing uh, is based on an Alice Hoffman novel called Rules of Magic, which is the prequel to Practical Magic. With it's a delightful movie. It's not quite what Alice how she writes. Uh, she writes much more in this kind of moody, magical realism sort of way. And anyway, so the the Rules of Magic is a prequel to that, and it's about three young teenagers, 17, 18 years old. But there's a way to do that without being YA, and it's, it's a struggle. You really have to, you know, I went down a lot of wrong roads. I'll put the little question box in my Instagram story for writers to ask questions, and yeah. uh, I get a lot of questions from people who are writing fantasy, science fiction, just stuff we would broadly maybe call genre, Comic-Con stuff. As they are starting, they might have an amazing idea, like, okay, so I have these three teenage girls, and there's witchcraft, and whatever, you know. I get a lot of versions of the question about, being very overwhelmed by creating a world. When you begin, that can be a really daunting, what do you, how do you think about it? I've always adapted IP. Say what you will about Stephanie Meyer's books. She is absolutely masterful at creating a world. She has very defined rules. You can ask her about vampire number 16 in chapter whatever, and she's like, well, that guy ate oatmeal for breakfast way back. I mean, she has like every detail awesome. thought out. And with Jessica Jones, Marvel as a universe has a specific set of rules as well. There's always kind of a semi-pseudoscience to whatever the powers are. Mm-hmm. There's not just you know magic. Then I came across... Alice Hoffman, who's always been one of my favorite authors, I approached it with the same way that I approached Twilight, which is, okay, there's a set of rules. Mm. Every fantasy world needs a set of rules. They can do this, but they can't do that. They can create uh, a tree. Well, how come they can't create a black hole? Well, how come they can just create money if they're having money problems? There's just a huge amount of, at every turn, there's a world. And I I approached Alice Hoffman's work with that. And it took me a very long time to figure out that that was entirely wrong. It's magical realism. It is magical realism. It is just, there are no rules. Think of like Water for Chocolate or Pan's Labyrinth. There's no, it's a different world. Mm. And that completely blew my mind because I thought I really understood the whole genre adaptation thing. And it's like, it depends on the book and the world and the tone and, Wait, you just got me really excited. It sounds so different than, well, like I just spent five seasons in a writer's room doing a- On my favorite freaking show, which is off the air now. I can't believe it. I want to cast every one of those actors in something cool. Oh, please do. I love them. They're darling, darling people to work with. But that was a rule that was, that was a, a world with very rigorous rules. And you had the book too. Yeah, we, we did. And that was such a treasure trove. I mean, I frequently tell people like, don't be afraid to rip just a little off. Don't plagiarize. Don't do anything actionable. But everybody is inspired by everybody else. And if what speaks to you is how rigorous Lev Grossman's world is and how, you know, his particular kind of creativity in creating a, a world that feels real with magic, well, you know, he had recently read Harry Potter. Like, that's not a coincidence. Right. Yeah, like Narnia. World. and Like, everybody, mm-hmm. there's a lineage for all of those books. So way back when I asked if you had re- uh, run a writer's room before, I had, there was a reason I asked you that question, which was, I'm just wondering what your experience with this was, because I feel like my understanding of how to write scripts transformed when I started running a room, just yeah. essentially having to direct the attention of many writers to specific problems? Oh, well, actually, yeah, in terms of just running a room, I've been doing that for years as a, mm-hmm. as a number two in, on many different shows, uh, Dexter having been the most recent at that time. So do you have a bag of tricks for when people get stuck? I suppose I do. I mean, I just start repeating things. I'll stand up and walk around, get a little energy going, and I'm, I basically start repeating stuff like, you know, this character what did A, B, and C, and, and I just keep repeating that. Here's this character did A, B, and C, and then, you know, this character did A, B, and C, and then, <laughs> or try to say it in a slightly different way. But allowing room to think, because those mm-hmm. silences are really important too, and for everyone to just kind of ponder. And if it goes on too long, then I'll, I'll just come up with some bullshit, like, what if, you know, um, it's completely bad, but maybe you'll get something generated. I do actually a version of the same thing. And I'm always a little concerned that everyone in the room is getting annoyed by the sound of my voice because I will just say back to them everything we figured out so far. Exactly. Yes, that's, that's exactly a much better articulated way of saying it. <laughs> so I, I do this now. I'm in my office. There's a cork board right here. 
if I'm breaking something on my own, if I'm writing a movie, something like that, and I get stuck, now I do the same thing, like a fucking crazy person wandering around the house, telling myself the story over and over again until I hit the part where I'm stuck. Um, it got really interesting when um, my boyfriend moved in. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was like, is this the real you? I didn't know. (laughs) Boyfriend, now husband, right? Now husband, yeah. Well, you know, there was a moment early on where I think there was some novelty to living with a writer where I would be sitting on my couch typing madly and I would look up and he'd just be like standing in the door like, like interesting. She's really in a sort of fugue state. But I think over the years, the the level of angst and crabbiness that comes with it. (laughs) it. Love calls it my, you know, are you you still in writer mode? It's like, yeah, you're a cocktail. (laughs) You know? Yeah, what is your writer mode? Do you, are you pretty checked out from the world? or When you finish, you know, that, that fugue state and, and you come out and uh, it's, it's hard to form words and to actually relate and it's still very internal and it just takes a while to kind of like, oh, there's another human being in the room and, you know. Is it always deadlines? How do you make yourself write when you just don't fucking feel like it? I just sit my ass in the chair. I say it's my job. Just sit in the chair and start writing. I don't care if you feel like it or not. And there's been so many times where, it's like, I'm having, I'm on doing seven days a week, and you know, mm. we have guests over, whatever, and they're all my my office right it looks out on the pool, <laughs> and so my guests and Lev, my husband, are are out there swimming around with drinks and and beers, and I'm like, <laughs> just really like, oh my god. I want to be out there, but you know, you just, you got to do what you got to do. I got to tell you, I've talked to a lot of writers. Everybody keeps saying this. I hope somebody is getting some comfort from the fact that there's no magic wand that gets waved over people when they have like a hit movie where, oh no, Melissa doesn't, it doesn't ever suck for her anymore because now she's a very fancy writer. I know, right? (laughs) And you you keep on hoping that. I keep on thinking, well, I'm I'm decades into it. Surely I I know what I'm doing now. It's like, well, no, you don't. And Alice Hoffman's books have now, uh, you know, beaten you. It was brutal to go like, oh my God, I'm I'm decades into my career. I shouldn't be feeling, I I should have more confidence in this. I can't, shouldn't be feeling like a freaking failure, you know? I mean, I know that that was hell on the inside of it, and I'm not dismissing the pain at all, but that makes me really excited about the show. (laughs) You wrote some half dozen (laughs) vampire movies. You mastered that. Jessica Jones, really strong voice. It's like to hear that you found a piece of material that so deeply challenged you. I'm so excited to see what came out of you, like what was unearthed inside you to meet the challenge. Well, and, and I, I had something that I didn't haven't had in the past, which is a partner. I, Dana Barada and I did this one together. So that helps a lot, too. When you have someone that you can call up and just go, I'm stuck on this. And she's stuck on her own thing. And, you know, we just go back and forth and, and work it out. And it's always it's always about that. It's always about who, who you can talk to, who you can rely on for story. And that's all of it. That's the entire battle. I feel like what you're saying, here's why I want to underline it, because first of all, I had bought this bullshit ideal of an auteur as someone who did it themselves. It came from deep inside him, usually, and, yeah. you know, and no one could touch a word of it versus the truth that people, first of all, not only can it be better, but you're just like allowed to ask for help. I was often really reluctant to ask people. So, you know, I had my few people who like weren't necessarily writers, might have been just friends who I would trust to read material. But I was reluctant to admit I didn't know everything because surely they've hired me because I'm supposed to be perfect. Yeah, the other thing I struggled with is I had always thought that, you know, the original idea, an original script is Mm -hmm. sort of the, the golden compass. So my entire career was like, you've got to come up with an original idea. You have to just come up with an original world. You have to invent that. And when I started to actually make some progress with my career was when I started adapting IP. And I, I realized that's just how I do it. You know, it's that kind of Charlie Kaufman versus Steve Zalian, you know, mm-hmm. both extraordinary writers, but one creates, Charlie Kaufman creates these extraordinary worlds. In a million years, I couldn't invent those kind of worlds. Mm-hmm. And Steve Zellian adapts these beautiful books into extraordinary movies. So it's all about finding the right milieu for yourself, for your, your voice, your what works for you. And for me, it's, it's adaptation. I mean, there's a practical part to it, which is that at least as of this recording, people in our business who are the decision makers are somewhat calmed about the level of risk if there's substantial IP attached. And 
why argue on principle with something that helps you get a green light? I mean, the, the first writer who wrote Jessica Jones in the Marvel Universe Brian Michael Bendis and Michael Gatos, yeah. Yeah, they had a point of view and a strong beating heart for her, but then to hand that character to you and to your writer's room, the things that you said in that first season about what her experience was, it's like the IP was a doorway that you walked through. Right. We told this long arc sexual assault storyline for the character Julia. You know, Lev Grossman is an amazing author who, you know, wrote that story for Julia with a lot of care, but it's different in the book. And so I've always been so grateful that like this IP existed, it handed me this like incredible portal to explore, uh, you know, the building of a true survivor over like five seasons using magic, <laughs> right? Which is like, oh, awesome. I'm pretty sure that's not what he was thinking when he wrote it. Yeah, I mean, Brian Michael Bendis and, and Michael Gatos really gave me that with Jessica Jones, because one of the stories in their graphic novel was, uh, what a character was his kill grave. He did something different with it, you know, with that Finnegal character and, and didn't, you know, he, that was, they went somewhere else with that. But it just sort of lent itself to this, the story of, of rape and Jessica Jones being a survivor. So when you started and you were a tiny infant writing scripts, <laughs> like tiny baby Melissa, did you envision writing these kinds of things? Did you think that this is where your path would lead? No, not at all. I mean, I was really... Uh, I was inspired by, you know, Winnie Holtzman and uh, My So-Called Life. David Kelly, you know, just spoke to me with picket fences and all of that. And so I, I really thought that I was, that that was my bent. I mean, it's a very female way to go, mm -hmm. relationship dramas. And I continued to work for 10 some odd years. And then Dexter hit. Mm -hmm. And my, my agent over at UTA, he was, he was like, you got to, you got to go up for this. It's a serial killer. Why? I'm party of five. And, and <laughs> he's like, no, I'm telling you. And who knew that that was going to be my voice? I didn't know, you know, until I was writing. It's like, and, you know, they kind of moved into head writer of it all and realized that, oh, the serial killer with a little black humor is exactly right for me. And that, and that kind of paved the way for everything else. I had no idea I would be this woman when I was 20. I mean, some of it matches up with what I wanted or envisioned, but there are so many details to my life. But I, like, I never thought I'd get married. Yeah, um, I was surprised. I, I, I met and fell in love with Lebor on our 28th year. You should receive trophies. <laughs> I, I, we should. So it's, it's sort of the same with your voice as a writer. It's like what we think we're going to be when we're 20 or 25, and then what we grow into as we just get our 10,000 hours and our 20,000 hours. The great thing about being a writer, of course, is that there is no wasted time. All the pursuits that I had before I moved into this profession of, of being a choreographer. That's how I got my very first gig mm -hmm. was uh, a dance movie for Paramount Television. Mm -hmm. It was a right, but the fact that I had aspired to be a choreographer, that's what got me that gig. That's what got me Step Up, which then got me Twilight, you know, is just this, this sort of my little background that I had as, you know, pursuing that life as a choreographer. Yeah, it's like it, all the pieces of the buffalo get used. We just can't really yeah. pick how, you know. I love it, all the pieces of the buffalo. That's all of it. It's like we're using the whole fucking thing. But just, you know, you don't get to control that process. It's not actually, I don't feel that in control of it, especially now, which is sort of segues me to my question of how are you doing in this pandemic? <laughs> how is writing going? How are, how are How has your life changed in this situation, if it has? I was kind of home writing to begin with, so mm. structurally it hasn't really changed that much. But because everything's kind of been put, put on hold, uh, I'm I'm now floating around in the development world, and and it's just it's it's too. I just want to like write something and get it done, you know, like finish the script and have this done, and that that to me is uh, the structure in this event is much more appealing. This sort of like, well, I could do this story, or I could do this story. I was like, oh god. Are you strict with yourself about a schedule while you're home? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's gotten a little more narrow. <laughs> I get to the desk a little later. <laughs> yeah, no, I have to. There has to be a certain amount of hours and, and get your ass in the chair or nothing will happen.